Welcome back to Game Theory 101, I'm William Spaniel, and today's topic is lotteries. In previous lectures, we have looked at linear orderings. These form when an individual's preferences are both complete and transitive. For example, Donald's linear ordering for food looked like this, where Chinese food was preferred to Armenian food, which was preferred to Brazilian food. Ultimately, what we want to do with linear orderings is convert them to numerical utilities, which then makes solving strategic interactions a little bit easier. However, this utility conversion process is not so straightforward. To illustrate, let's look at two different utility representations. Here's utility number one. It gives Donald a payoff of three for Chinese food, two for Armenian food, and a lowly one for Brazilian food. Notice that this preserves the linear ordering. Donald is getting his highest payoff for his most preferred outcome, and his lowest payoff for his least preferred outcome. But there are other utility representations that preserve the linear ordering. For example, utility representation number two. This gives Chinese food a payoff of four, then two for Armenian food, and one for Brazilian food. This still preserves the linear ordering, but now it makes Chinese food look relatively more attractive as compared to utility representation for number one. But we could do this on and on and on. There are literally infinitely many utility representations that preserve the linear ordering. But for a lot of these, it's going to change how relatively attractive one outcome is versus another in terms of the intensity of that preference. And while once more it won't matter when we're thinking about a single outcome occurring with certainty versus another single outcome occurring with certainty, this does throw a wrench into our game plan when there's some sort of randomization to the process. And that's where lotteries come into play. In game theory, a lottery is a probability distribution over outcomes. For example, receiving A with probability one half and B with probability one half, well, that's a probability distribution over outcomes, which means we have a lottery. One of the reasons why I like teaching lotteries after going through basic game theory is that now that you've seen lots of games being solved, you know why randomization is really important for this field. Mixed strategies create lotteries, and for that reason, lotteries are very important when it comes to game theory. Think about a game of matching pennies. If I am playing heads with probability one half and tails with probability one half, even if you're playing a pure strategy, I have induced a lottery for both players. Because we're going to have, if you're playing a pure strategy, one outcome occurring with probability one half and another outcome occurring with probability one half. And this all means that we have to care about what this implies about the preferences that we have and how we represent uh, how we represent them with utilities. One other thing to note here, the lottery is a lottery, but not the type that game theorists really care about. So if you clicked on this video expecting me to talk about the game theory of things like Powerball, you're on the wrong video. Click on the annotation on your screen and you can go learn about that in a different video. But back to game theory lotteries. Why does this all matter? Well, think about these two different utility representations. And think about a choice for Donald that is A with certainty versus a 50-50 shot between B and C. For utility representation number one, what's happening here? Well, if Donald receives A with certainty, he gets a payoff of two. If Donald receives C with probability one half and B with probability one half, when we manipulate these payoffs, we multiply three times 0.5 and then add that to one times 0.5. Well, that equals two, which was his utility for the Armenian food. So in fact, he would be indifferent between having A with certainty and a lottery, a 50-50 lottery between B and C. But when it comes to expected utility representation number two, this is different. Here, Donald is still receiving two for Armenian food, but this 50-50 randomization between C and B, now when we multiply that out, four times one half plus one times one half is 2.5, which means according to utility representation number two, Donald prefers the lottery between those two things as opposed to receiving Armenian food with certainty. 
Now, what that means is that we need to be actually very careful when it comes to which utility representation we use to map the preferences. We can't just use a scale of utilities which preserves the linear ordering. It actually matters the relative intensity between the any two outcomes because when it comes to randomization, we might have a lottery being played which makes one outcome look better compared to that lottery for one utility representation and the opposite occurring for the other utility representation. But before we can even do that, we have to make some sort of assumptions about how individuals find preferences attractive. In other words, preference rules about lotteries themselves, even before we can start delving into the very specifics about comparing something like an outcome A to a 50-50 outcome between B and C. There are certain things that need to be true about the numbers that we use in order to be able to do any of this. And that's where these other two preference rules come into play for expected utility theory, independence over lotteries and continuity. I'll talk about independence next. Hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.